Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Uh, great to see all of you. Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, I'm Greg Castor of the Gustavus History Department, as I know at least some of you know. Um, this evening's talk inaugurates a speaker series in honor of James M. McPherson, Gustavus class of 1958. Some of you know he and his wife Patricia own my office, in effect. There's a nice plaque to them there. Um, uh, who, along with uh, Patricia, he and Jim and Patricia, uh, generously endowed the McPherson Professorship of American History, uh, which it's my great privilege and honor to hold as the first recipient. Dr. McPherson is the George Henry Davis 86th Professor Emeritus of United States History at Princeton University and the most influential Civil War historian of our time. At least I think so, David, you can correct me. His learning and scholarship are vast, and his landmark Pulitzer Prize winning history of the war battle cry of freedom enjoys wide readership among academics, students, and the general public. And again, I know some of you have read it. While Professor McPherson could not be here with us and sends both his gratitude and regrets, his sister Judy Biederman and her husband Larry uh, are able to join us. And I'd ask Judy and Larry to please stand for acknowledgement. Thank you so much. Gusty's class of 1970, and of course, Judy, some of you may know, worked for a, a long time in the biology department, uh, running, basically running labs. So thank you both for being here. An event like this requires the support of many, and uh, I'd like to extend a special thanks to Gustavus President Becky Bergman. We're, there you are, thank you. And Provost Brenda Kelly is somewhere. There you are, thank you both so much, uh, not only for your support of this event, but, and I really mean this, I know my colleagues do as well, for your continuing support of history and the humanities at Gustavus, which we cannot take for granted, shouldn't take for granted uh, these days especially. And my gratitude as well to the Office of the Chaplains, the Office of Equity and Inclusion, Lecture Series, the Bernardson Distinguished Chair of Lutheran Studies, Marsha Bungie's right here, the Programs in African Studies, Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies, Peace, Justice, and Conflict Studies, and the Departments of Communication Studies, English, History, Political Science, and Religion, whose collective co-sponsorship have made this evening possible. It truly is interdisciplinary and collaborative, which makes me very happy. I also want to thank our bookstore. Uh, they'll be back there for a book signing and sales later. Uh, and the Gustavus Technology Service, uh, Matthew Dobosensky, especially for their help. And now it's my great privilege and pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. David Blight. A native of Flint, Michigan, who earned his BA at Michigan State University and his PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Dr. Blight is the Sterling Professor of History of African American Studies and of American Studies and Director of the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale University. And perhaps no less important, he's a self-proclaimed Detroit Tigers fan for life. And when I met him at the airport, he had his Detroit Tigers uh, cap on. Right. Welcome to Twins Territory. Professor Blight is also a friend of Professor McPherson, and like him, a distinguished historian of the Civil War era, whose own learning and scholarship is vast, or are vast as well. Among his many acclaimed books are Race and Reunion, a study of how the Civil War was remembered, which won numerous awards, including the prestigious Bancroft, Abraham Lincoln, and Frederick Douglass Prizes. And of course, his recent magnificent biography, and I use that word deliberately, it is magnificent. Uh, the biography, Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, which again, I know some of you have read, some of you have read it with me in class, which won the Pulitzer for History in 2019. He's also editor of a superbly annotated, annotated edition of Douglass's famous 1845 Slave, uh, slave narrative autobiography, which I've had the pleasure of teaching for, for a long time and enjoys wide classroom use. I've taught all three of these books. And like Jim McPherson, Professor Blight is a lucid and compelling writer whose work not only illuminates the past but contains a profound grappling with the complex lived histories of core themes in our national life, themes like freedom, equality and their opposites. He is moreover, and again like Jim, a historian engaged with not just fellow academics, but also importantly the broader public. He writes in the New York Times, the Atlantic Magazine, he speaks on podcasts, hopefully 
Gustavus's podcast, we'll see. Um, he tweets at David W. Blight one. He's appeared on C-SPAN, YouTube, and in the recent, again, I know some of you have seen this, the recent, just fantastic HBO documentary, Frederick Douglass in Five Speeches. And maybe most exciting of all, he's been working with Barack and Michelle Obama's production company on an eventual film adaptation of his biography of Douglas. Some years ago, both my wife, Gustavus Professor Kate Wittenstein, Professor Emeritus of History, and I were fortunate to participate in separate summer seminars for college teachers led by Dr. Blight, one at Columbia and one at Yale in my, my case. Uh, we and the other participants uh, benefited immensely from both his scholarly knowledge and, and for me, best of all, his deep, obvious commitment to teaching a commitment no doubt informed by his years as a high school teacher before becoming a college professor. That same commitment was apparent in his concern about having to miss one of his classes to be here. And as his Twitter profile says, and I quote, teacher first. Even apart from his Yale responsibilities, Professor Blight is an extraordinarily busy fellow, much in demand, and I'm so grateful he could make time in his schedule to inaugurate this speaker series. I cannot think of a better person, a person more suited to that task. And all of this is to say we're in for a very special thought-provoking treat this evening. Following Professor Blight's talk, there will be some time for questions, brief Q&A, after which you'll have an opportunity to purchase paperback copies of the aforementioned books. I think there are a few copies of Douglas's narrative as well that Professor Blight has edited, now I think in its third edition, which is fantastic. So I urge you to have a look. I even urge you to buy some, right? And Professor Blight will be graciously signing. I also ask that you please silence your phones. And if you must leave for other obligations, as I know you might have to, students especially, please do so quietly, uh, closing the door uh, softly behind you. So now please join me in warmly welcoming David Blight to Gustavus, who will speak to us on the legacies of Frederick Douglass in our time. Thank you, Greg. And uh, the Vietermans, it's great to meet you. We had dinner together. Uh, this is a very special honor to deliver a lecture uh, named for, uh, supported by, in honor of, uh, Jim McPherson. Uh, maybe you already all know this, but Jim has long been uh, the gold standard of Civil War historians. I could name you any number of issues, uh, turns in interpretation, where uh, most of us just wondered, what did Jim think? I'm serious. And then we just agreed. <laughs> I've been with Jim McPherson, I've had the privilege of being with Jim McPherson at many conferences, uh, Hinder and Jan, most special of which was a full week we spent together in Israel at a conference uh, hosted by one of his former students at uh, Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Uh, well, <laughs> what better place to hold a three-day conference on comparative civil wars? Uh, <laughs> uh, it was an amazing conference. We were looking at civil wars everywhere in the world, uh, even the United States. Um, but the best part of that trip was two full days in a van touring all over Israel with a group of about six or eight historians, and Jim and Pat were kind of our senior advisors, let's put it that way. And one of the most vivid memories of that is when we stopped at the Dead Sea. You ever been to the Dead Sea? Most of us under the age of 60-something went down to whatever constituted bathing suits and went in and did the mud bath. Jim and Pat sat on little lawn chairs and watched us, <laughs> which was quite appropriate, I thought. But uh, I hope to God those photographs are not anywhere on the internet. <laughs> mud bath in the Dead Sea. Oh, I started reading Jim McPherson when I was a high school teacher, and then in graduate school. And I told some of you the story at dinner that I still remember the first time I ever called him because he turned me down. 
I was, I think, a final year of graduate school, and I was organizing a panel for the Organization of American Historians, and I was full of chutzpah, and I wanted McPherson to be like chair of the panel or something. I have no idea what the panel was on. But my mentor, Dick Sewell at Wisconsin, knew Jim and said, I'll call him up. He's a nice guy. And somehow, I pr as I said at dinner, probably through the phone book, you remember phone books? I got his home number. Called him up. Professor McPherson, would you blah, 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 blah. I'm so-and-so nobody. He said, uh, give me a moment. He got off the phone for, he probably went and asked Pat. Should I do this? No. He came back and he said, no. <laughs> Click. <laughs> Happily, I lived long enough to get to know Jim much, much better than that. And it really is an honor to, to deliver anything in, in Jim's name. And I'm and heartened to learn that he is indeed still in good health. Um, now, Greg and I have been trying to schedule this for over two years of pandemic, and I'm glad we finally managed to do it. Now this is, uh, this is going to be about Frederick Douglass, uh, primarily, not Jim McPherson, although I may find a way to quote Jim here somewhere. But I want to start with this passage, and it's not because I'm at an old Lutheran college and that I was raised Lutheran and I'm still recovering. <laughs> uh, take the boy out of the Lutheran church, but there are some values you can't take out of the boy. This is from Genesis 8, 11. I will come back to it. You won't get it at first. Well, maybe you will. And the dove came into him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. It's a famous passage in Genesis about Noah's Ark. Frederick Douglass employed that passage more than once in his magnificent oratory, and I will come back to that at the very end to show you when and where. First of all, I want to uh, pay tribute where tribute is due. Uh, some of you may have heard me speak on this somewhere on YouTube before, I don't know. But I would never have done this new biography of Douglas had it not been for a collection that I encountered now about hmm, 15 years ago. Could even be six, I've been saying 15 for more than a year, so it's probably 16 years ago. In Savannah, Georgia, of all places, uh, owned by a man named Walter Evans. Long story short, I went to Savannah to give a talk on Douglas's narrative to a group of middle and high school teachers, which I've done many times. I love doing that. And my host at that point was the head of the Georgia Historical Society, who said there's a local collector here he'd like to meet. OK. Uh, he'd like to go to lunch with us. Eh, OK, a collector. Well, that day I met the most extraordinary man, Walter, I met his wife too, Walter and Linda Evans. Uh, Walter is an African-American retired surgeon who grew up in segregated Savannah, uh, came north for all of his higher education, Howard University, a stop in, at the University of Hartford in Connecticut, and then to the Michigan Medical School. And he practiced as a general surgeon, was very successful at it, in Detroit for over 30 years which gave us a lot in common because I grew up in Flint and we're both Detroit Tigers fans, although he had season tickets. <laughs> he could afford them. Um, but Walter's great passion in the world is collecting African-American rare books, manuscripts, and especially artworks. He has one of the finest, uh, maybe the finest, private collection of African-American artists anywhere in the world. Uh, a lot of that art is in his own house, a uh, big four-story brownstone in Savannah. He quit as a surgeon, retired back to Savannah, and has this collection in his house. He invited me over to show me his Douglas collection, which that day when I met him, he got out on his dining room, well, he got portions of it out on his dining room table. 
And I'd like to tell you it was the road to Damascus and I was struck dead and I, at that moment, was destined to write a big biography of Douglas. That's not true. I took many months to decide to do this because it was so daunting, but there was an extraordinary collection of Douglas material that no one had ever used. Others had seen it, but no one had used it. Uh, I don't have time to go into what it consists of, um, except that it, the heart of it are nine very large Douglas family scrapbooks that were kept by his uh, two of his sons in particular, his daughter Rosetta had a hand in it too, over the last third of their father's life. Extraordinary scrapbooks, thousands of newspaper clippings, most of which you could never duplicate now because all those old newspapers are not digitized. They don't even exist in most archives. Some of them do, most of them don't. And a lot of family material, family letters, everything from marriage certificates to photographs. It was a window into Frederick Douglass's particularly later life, the last third of his life, from the end of the Civil War to when he died in 19, uh, excuse me, 1895, that we had simply never had before. If Americans tended to know much about Frederick Douglass, it comes from the narrative, because it's widely taught. We might know the younger Douglass, the, the heroic Douglass who escaped from slavery and made himself into uh, a great orator, and maybe they know something about him being alive during the Civil War and meeting Lincoln or something. But, but by and large, people have not known much about that aging Douglass, the older man, the, the older patriarch, um, the old man eloquent, as he was sometimes called. Again, it took many, many months to decide to do this, but I decided finally. Uh, my agent actually talked me into it. You're doing it, she said. No, yes, no, yes, yes. Um, and so I spent many, many uh, Yale University spring breaks, uh, plus a lot of other weeks, uh, with the very tough duty of spending the Azalea period in Savannah. Um, <laughs> but most of my time was at Walter and Linda's dining room table, the greatest archive I have ever had the privilege to work in. They are to this day dear friends, and the good news, to wrap that up, uh, I could talk all night about that collection, but I won't. Um, it took years to convince Walter to do it, but he finally, <laughs> he's a very good businessman, by the way, he waited until this book came out and uh, then um, sold the Douglas collection to the Beinecke Library at Yale, which is where it is now housed and has now been completely digitized, even the scrapbooks. So the whole world can use it. That is two blocks from my office. It could have been there eight years ago, <laughs> but uh, Walter's just too clever a businessman. And he knows what he owns. Now, uh, this book, I want to say uh, uh, just a few words about its structure and how one attempts to do biography. And then I want to fulfill the promise of this lecture, which is to talk a bit about some legacies of Douglas's life and his words and his writings uh, for our uh, distracted, difficult, terrible times. Um, I did what all historians do, uh, I think, uh, in particularly biographers. I boiled this very complex, long 77 years life with a trajectory across almost the entire 19th century down to six themes. Not seven, not five, six. There are other themes, but the big ones simply are these. The first is words. If you've encountered Frederick Douglass as a reader, you already know what I mean. He was a master of this language. He did not have one day of formal education in his life. He spent 20 years as a slave, uh, 11 of them on the eastern shore of Maryland where he was everything from a field hand to a house servant uh, to worse. 
and nine of those years in Baltimore in an urban setting where he learned a whole variety of skills, not least of which was his literacy, which he took to like manna from heaven. No one can ever quite figure out precisely why Douglas had such an affinity with words and language, except that he encountered it early, was taught his, his alphabet and literacy when he was seven and eight years old by his mistress, Sophia Auld, learned a lot about reading from that magnificent little book called the Columbian, it wasn't little actually, it's almost 300 pages, the book called the Columbian Orator, which he encountered among his, his little white friends, these boys in the streets of Baltimore, most of them Irish. He called them the, the street urchins, who he meets them when he's 10 and 11, and they're all carrying a book to school called the Columbian Orator. And little Fred Bailey, which was his first real name, his real first, his real last name <laughs> until he changed it, he wanted a copy. At the age of 11, he managed to go to a bookstore on Thames Street in Fells Point, Baltimore, and basically bartered for his own copy. Turns out this book, this Colombian orator, was the second best-selling school reader in the United States, second only to the famous McGuffey Reader. The Colombian Order went through some 27 editions after it was published in 1897, and the edition Douglas managed to get, was actually published in Maryland, a slave state, even though a lot of the book is an anti-slavery tone. The book is a collection, it's a compendium of speeches delivered in antiquity and during the European and American Enlightenment. I'd say the bulk, the, the majority are from the 18th, the 18th century Enlightenment, Britain and the US. But the first 20 pages or so is like a manual of oratory. It's a how-to book. How do you do oratory? And it has everything in it from how to gesture with your shoulders and your arms, how to hold the position of your body, how to modulate your voice from lower and softer to higher and higher and higher, on to crescendos. But then it has a long section on how the true orator must reach the hearts of his audience with a moral message. This kid started reading this book when he's 11 and 12. So it's not that surprising that he would become such a great orator. It took a lot of other steps along the way to get to be the greatest orator of the 19th century. But that book that he found when he was 11 has something to do with it. And when he escaped from slavery at age 20 in late August of 1838 out of Baltimore on three train rides and three steamboat rides to the Hudson River and across in a small little ferry boat into Manhattan, the only possessions he had on his body were the sailor's suit that he wore as a disguise, his big old broad brimmed hat, a few dollars in his pocket that his uh, fiance Anna had given him and his Colombian orator. And one of the greatest thrills of my life, may seem odd, but uh, at Cedar Hill in Washington, the Douglas home, the National Park Service now owns and manages, um, they have a portion of Douglas's library there. Most of it is out in a warehouse in Maryland but uh, they let me do a couple after hours tours there a couple of times where I got to go in all the nooks and crannies and I got to sit at Douglas's desk. I had to wear gloves everywhere. But they let me hold Douglas's original uh, copy of the Columbian Orator. I opened it. There was a guy looking at right over my shoulder, everything I did, but words. We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be talking about Frederick Douglass if it weren't for what he did with language, with words. His extraordinary ability to tell stories, to write narrative, but to find metaphors for this American condition with race, this American terrible condition with slavery, and this, this thing called America, this idea, this experiment. Douglas became what I like to call the prose poet of American democracy in the 19th century. 
We've been hearing so much in recent years about the problem of our democracy. There's your first legacy about Douglas's life for us. You, you want to you get down for a while, for a few hours, about what democracy is supposed to be, or can be, or ought to be? Read some Douglas. You want to understand what it means to have democracy denied? and yet to still keep coming back and demanding it and demanding it and demanding it and defining it and defining it, read some Douglas. Second big theme in the book is Douglas's autobiographies, obviously related to the first theme of words, but this is a man who wrote 1,200 pages of autobiography. He wrote three of them. And then he revised the third one yet another time, uh, seven or eight years later, into, in effect, a fourth edition. He wrote the first in 1845, the second one in 1855, which is really his masterpiece. The second autobiography that mostly, well, is taught here and there, but is not taught as much as that first short narrative because the original narrative is short. It's only 120 pages. It's so teachable and brilliant, written by a 27-year-old. I always ask my students, you going to be ready for your first autobiography when you're 27? Some of these Yale kids have so much chutzpah, they kind of say, yeah. Sure you will. Give me a break. <laughs> but that second one, which he wrote when he was 37, is his masterpiece. That's over 400 pages. That's a much more political autobiography. That's, that's the abolitionist who's become the political abolitionist. That's the abolitionist who's even flirting with possible uses of violence as a tactic. That's the unchained, you know, unleashed Douglas who was barely able to make a living, but he was an independent thinker and writer by then. And it, is, it belongs right there in the middle of the 1850s when it was published at the heart of the American Renaissance with Whitman and Emerson, and even Melville, whom I adore. Uh, but Melville would, would say, fine. Melville would let Douglas in. I don't doubt that. He never got asked, but I'm sure he would. But uh, Douglas left us so much in autobiography to contend with. And I must say one last thing on that. If you work on someone like Douglas, and there have been other figures in history like this who write a lot of autobiography, it's a great source, but it also becomes your subject. You have to keep analyzing, why does this guy keep writing about himself so much? What's with all this vanity? What's with, you know, why is it always about you? Fred, I never call him Fred, Frederick. He used to say that to people. Someone would call him Fred, he'd say, Madam, that will be Frederick. Yes, sir. But the thing about the, it's really true of all autobiography. If you write, when you write your autobiography, what are you telling us? What you want to tell us? What are you not telling us? What you don't want us to know. And if you're really famous when you do this, or you're trying to really reveal something about your life, but some other things not, there's a great deal left out. And in Douglas's magnificent autobiographical voice, and he really is there at the pinnacle of American memoir writing. He tells us almost nothing about his private life, about his two marriages, about his four surviving adult children, about what it meant when his 11-year-old daughter Annie died when he was abroad in England, about his relationships with an English woman named Julia Griffiths and a German woman named Otilia Hassing. His wife Anna, of 44 years, gets one mention in 1,200 pages of autobiography, and she is called my wife. Oh, Fred. Drick. <laughs> but it's 19th century, for one thing. People didn't do any tell-all autobiographies in the 19th century, and that was off limits. He didn't want us to know. And it was a difficult, difficult part of his life to tell. Your job as a biographer is to get to it nonetheless, however you can. Side doors, back doors, by letters, any way you can.
third big theme in this biography is the Bible. And I say that with no apologies. Uh, to understand this particular thinker and writer, you have to understand how deeply steeped he was, especially in the Old Testament and in the Hebrew prophets. I don't want to dwell on that too long because that'll take up the rest of the night. I've known this ever since I first started reading Douglas, but I didn't understand it. I did my dissertation on Douglas. It's my first book, which Greg showed me his copy of today that has post-its all over it. You made my day, man. I actually got a, a $21 royalty check on that book, so there are three or four other people who still teach that book. <laughs> it's the only place it can possibly be read. They keep it in print because of you. Anyway. But Douglas learned language in churches. He learned language by reading the King James. And the more and more and more you read Douglas, you realize the cadences of the King James Bible are the cadences of his language. That's, why, that's how he gained. The first thing he remembers Miss Sophia all reading to him out loud. This, this Douglas is a tricky writer, though. He claims he first remembers her reading the book of Job to him out loud. Now, why would he read a Job to a little eight-year-old slave boy? I'm not sure. I mean, that's a hell of a story for anybody to digest. But he says, I remember her reading the book of Job to me. You know, one of the most complete tragedies in the Bible. Why would she? I don't know. I have no idea why she did. But... He came to love the Hebrew prophets. His favorite was, was Isaiah, which is not uncommon. It's the longest book in the Bible, two or three Isaiahs, however many. Some of you are better experts on that than I am. Um, he also loved Jeremiah. He was a Jeremiah. He loved Amos. He loved Ezekiel. Um, it's a rare speech that Douglas gives after the middle of the 1840s without some use of the Hebrew prophets. And if you're at all familiar with his greatest speech of all, the 4th of July speech, uh, What to the Slaves of the 4th of July, delivered in 1852, it has no less than three uses of Isaiah, two uses of the Psalms, and at least two other Hebrew prophets I'm actually forgetting. His use of the Bible got me struggling with what to call this book. It got me struggling with that very word, prophet. Hebrew prophets. I have no formal theological training. I did take Lutheran catechism, but I don't count that. Well, I count it to some extent, but, uh, but I've always been crazy fascinated with theology, even though I don't know what I'm doing with it. But I have m numerous friends who do, and over the years, my friends who are theologians helped me at various levels of my career in learning to read this and read that, read him, read, read her, read this, read that, interpreters of the Old Testament in particular. And there were many who influenced me in writing this book to the point where I finally gained the confidence to put that word prophet in the title. Prophet's a big word, isn't it? You shouldn't just throw it around. And you know, we use it, we use it like, a, like a useless adjective. Ah, that's prophetic. You thought the score would be four to three, and you said that. That's not prophecy. Ah. It's like the word tragedy. We use it like popcorn. Words like prophet and words like tragedy should be reserved for what they're meant for. Well, just my opinion. But, um, one of the theologians I finally got to reading very carefully was Abraham Heschel, the great Jewish theologian, maybe the greatest of the 20th century. Uh, there's a new biography out on him by uh, Julian Zelizer, which is a magnificent book. Heschel wrote a book of some nearly 600 pages back in the 1950s called The Prophets, which is his study, analysis, meditation on who and what the Hebrew prophets actually are and were. And I came to find Douglas in Heschel. And others, too, uh, Walter Brueggemann, um, uh, others, Robert Alter, uh, uh, who has a whole new translation of the Bible out. But Heschel really helped me, 
Because in Heschel's work, there are <laughs> hundreds of definitions of what a prophet is. One of my favorites was this, where he said, the prophet is human. Yet he employs notes one octave too high for our ears. He experiences moments that defy our understanding. He is neither a singing saint nor a moralizing poet, but an assaulter of our mind. Often his words begin to burn where conscience ends. An assaulter of our mind. That is what the Hebrew prophets do or did. Jeremiah lived to assault your mind. That's what Douglas did. Over and over. I would read Heschel and I'd say, aha, uh -huh, that's Douglas. Ooh, thank you, that's Douglas. Very quickly, the other three big themes are, first of all, uh, fourth, how a uh, radical outsider, an old, a radical abolitionist, always on the outside of any kind of real power, becomes over time, after the Civil War, after emancipation, into the Reconstruction years, becomes a kind of political insider. That's, a, that's quite a story. We've, had, we've seen it happen with many other people in, in history. Think of some of the great leaders of the Civil Rights Movement. Think of a John Lewis. My goodness. Uh, and many, many, many others from the Civil Rights Movement who became congressmen, mayors. And that guy from Chicago, for God's sake, became president. He wasn't in the civil rights movement, but he was a what, community organizer. Outsiders who become political insiders. And what kind of prices do they pay for that? What sort of compromises might they make for that? That's part of the story of the older Douglas. And fifth, uh, I did what all biographers, I think, have to do. I had to balance here, and it becomes a major theme in this book, trying to balance the private life with the public life. That's what biography does now, modern biography. Now, there are still biographies that are essentially like biographies of presidents that are only about the presidency. And that's fine. And, and uh, there's some great books of that. Biographies of uh, maybe a great artist or musicians where it's just about the music. I mean, I'm not familiar with all the scholarship on Beethoven and, and Mozart. Um, I've read one biography of Beethoven. Woo! Uh, but how do you write? You can't write about Beethoven without some of that private life. I mean, the guy went nuts. Couldn't hear. And yet he could still write that. I mean, how can you? That's not possible. We're, we're just humans. He wasn't, I guess. But I had a vow in this book that I was not going to write a chapter on the public and a chapter on the private and then ba you know, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The children will be in this chapter and the wives in that chapter. No, I made a vow that the public and the private would be in every chapter together. Or at least I tried because that's the way we actually live. You don't get up any day and live only your public life. Now, it may seem that way some days because you know, you, your teaching load's so heavy and <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, ask Joe Biden right now if he uh, has days that are only his public life. He'd probably say, ah, it's all I have. <laughs> uh, and he gets four hours sleep, probably. But I was determined here not to separate these two, to try to write a biography as it's lived, if I could. And then last, may seem standard, but it's very important in this guy's life. <laughs> Uh, the sixth big theme is Douglas the artist, the intellectual, the creative mind, the writer. Um, because from the moment he takes that first stage in, uh, on Nantucket Island in 1841, uh, he's not a writer yet. That took more time. And he never did spell very well. Uh, but he becomes a creature of his voice. In fact, early on, the title I wanted to use for this book, and I thought I was so clever, was Frederick Douglass, Biography of a Voice. And my editor, Simon Schuster, said, nope. <laughs> Can't have that. OK. He said, too literary. You'll lose some readers with that. 
He's probably right. But that is kind of what I wrote. It's the biography of a voice. A written voice, a spoken voice, and that written voice can be in many different kinds. He's a religious thinker, a political thinker. He was a journalist. He was a great journalist. He ran his own newspaper for 16 years on a shoestring. He was a prose poet. He wrote a lot of actual verse poetry, but it wasn't his best stuff. He kept most of his poetry in a drawer, which is where it belongs. Well, don't you write some poems now and then that the world probably shouldn't see? <laughs> All right. Now, uh, I promised to tell you what that uh, quote about Noah had to do. So let me float back, if I may, to this promise about legacies and to the Noah quote as a way of wrapping up. Um, I've learned many things in the two and a half or more years since my book came out. I was very lucky that my book came out in early fall of 2018. I had pff, most of two years on the uh, speaking trail, uh, book events of all kinds, book festivals of all kinds. Then the pandemic hit, but it didn't stop, as many of you know. It all went into webinars and online book clubs, and it's been unbelievable how much I have learned about how Americans do read books. Not enough of them, but a lot of them do. And actually, in certain kinds of publishing, it went up during the pandemic. People needed books, and people needed help. I must have been on... 200 events where you get asked, how can Douglas help us understand Trump? Or the Trump era? Or what we're going through? Or the fate of our democracy? Or our political condition? <sighs> and, you know, you used to be able to bat away those questions as a historian, right? You could say, uh, we don't predict. Not our, not our job. Can't do that anymore. You gotta have some answers. How do we face racial reckonings? How many, how many times have you heard that term, racial reckoning, in the last years? We're, you, we're hearing it well before the summer of George Floyd, but you really heard it in, two, in 2020 and in the wake of that, and we still do. We're going through a racial reckoning again, but America's had a lot of racial reckonings, and a lot of them happened in Douglas's lifetime. And the fact is, you want to understand what racial reckonings are to go through, Douglas's entire life was a racial reckoning every day, in every way. So if you want to understand, what does it mean to have to confront the past or to confront race or confront a racial reckoning, confront a society that did, does not welcome you, is full of different kinds of racism, some of it very hidden in systemic forms and laws and in buildings and in I don't know what else, and some of it blunt. Douglas got Jim Crowed more times than he could ever count. Legacies, literacy. What is the meaning of words? Do words have power? We like to think so. Can words change the world? We'd like to think so. Can words stop Putin's war? Probably not. But we try with them, don't we? What is race? Is race a thing? Is it a concept? Is it, is it biology of some kind? Is it narrative? Is it story? Is it a social construction? Douglas, a thousand times over, he's hardly alone here, had to define this thing called race in the 19th century and for a major portion of his life during the time the United States was pro-slavery. <laughs> he gave up incredible speech, it was actually a paper, a, a formal, the first time he ever spoke at an, in an academic environment was it uh, um, in Cleveland or just outside of Cleveland, um, the, f uh, the famous school just outside Cleveland where the Cleveland Clinic is, oh, I can't believe I'm blocking, anyway, he was invited there in 1854 
to give a commencement address. Frederick Douglass, never been to school in his life. What does he choose to speak on? He called it the Negro ethnologically considered. Very academic. The speech, though, is a brilliant takedown of scientific racism. He took on Louis Agassiz and a half dozen other of the major natural scientists who were, who, were, who were all the highest places in American academia who were developing these theories of polygenesis and racial capacities. And Douglas, it's such a modern speech when you read it today. It, it, it's kind of the same stuff we're still debating. Uh, what did slavery mean? How important was slavery in the making of the United States? You want a legacy to deal with? We're talking about it all the time now. I'm glad of that in one way. I direct a center for the study of slavery and abolition at Yale. It's good for business. Our fellowship applications have been going up every year. The field is hot, and that's good all over the world. But what is slavery? What forms did it take? What did it do to human beings emotionally? What did it do to human beings physically? Douglas always said he did not fear what slavery would do to his body as much as what it could do to his mind. If you want to understand the meaning of slavery and the minds of slaveholders, Read some Douglas. In fact, one of the main themes of the narrative, the first autobiography, is his analysis of the slaveholder's mind. It's a brilliant part of it. He's, the guy's a kid. He's 27, and he's analyzing their minds. Legacies. How about war and peace? Oh, Lord. That's what my first book was all about, the meaning of the Civil War and Douglas's life and thought. It isn't always pretty with Douglas, though, because Douglas wanted the Civil War. He wanted it to come. Let the conflict come, as he, as he said in a, a headline of an editorial in his newspaper in 1861. He saw it as somehow the coming of an Armageddon, the coming of some kind of retributive justice by God or by nature or by history on the sins of America, which were rooted in slavery. He became one of, if not the most virulent war propagandist in America by 1862. I have an entire chapter on this in the book. Douglas, the war propagandist, will shock you. He advocated the slaughter of slaveholders, unequivocally, without any compassion. He was saying the same things about slaveholders that you may be seeing Ukrainians say in their interviews on TV about what they think of the Russian troops. Have you seen those interviews with the, the older women who say, I want to get my hands on a Russian soldier. I'm going to tear their heads off. Legacies? Douglas was also, because he had to learn to be, over time, a pragmatist, a political pragmatist. He had to learn how to shoulder up to political parties that he didn't always agree with, especially that Republican Party, that original Republican Party. Douglas had to learn politics out of the world of radical abolitionism. You ever been in a lot of meetings with a group of real radicals? First of all, they never agree with each other. By definition, they fight. And they're often not overly sensitive. And by the way, Douglas, for lots of personal reasons, even psychological reasons that I try to deal with to some degree in the book, was a very hypersensitive person. He didn't trust people very well. And if he ever sensed a slight whether it's a racial slight or a slight about his lack of any education, watch out. Legacies. 
How often do we find ourselves now arguing about, fighting about, not afraid anymore in academic settings to say what is right and what is wrong? Although academics always have, don't we? We're good at getting around that. Well, on the, on the one hand, uh, but, 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 but however, or sort of, uh, would admit that phrase sort of always works to get inside and around and over anything, doesn't it? Um, I'm, and Douglas was not always right. I, I point out many w times in the book where he just overstepped or didn't get it. <sighs> but he is an example, if you're looking for a human being who grows into major leadership, mostly leadership by language, where he had to attain a certain humility about what he knew and did not know. And sometimes we academics are not all very good at that. We're supposed to be experts. We're supposed to know things. And then there's democracy. Endlessly now we are debating this thing called democracy. Is our democracy surviving? How's it doing? Are our institutions functioning well? Eh, some maybe. Some, I'd argue, not at all. That United States Senate, one of the most undemocratic things in our Constitution, and we keep wanting it to be democratic. It's designed not to be. And the Electoral College, what can you say? It belongs back in the 18th century where it was created, and it didn't even have much of a good function then. Do you know what the count would be on the U.S. Supreme Court? Have you, have you students ever stopped on this one? If we didn't have the Electoral College and Al Gore became president because of the uh, popular vote and Hillary Clinton became president because of the popular vote, the ratio on the Supreme Court would be about seven to two liberals. And we're the only, pla the only country in the world that has a thing like the Electoral College. Go, when you go abroad to teach and people ask you, you Americans, and, and they are, they're fascinated with America. I taught in Germany for a year and in England for a year. But they will often say, this uh, thing you call electoral college, uh, why do you have that? <laughs> and what do you do? What do you say? Uh, it was an 18th century creation when they had this belief in deference to... Uh, Anyway, sorry. But democracy is for Douglas not just about politics. Democracy for Douglas was the way it was for Walt Whitman. It was about the maximization of human beings with other human beings. Yes, you need law. God knows we need law. And we need institutions and structures. You know, James Madison understood that. If they didn't come up with a structure there in that Constitution, this thing, this America, was going to go to pieces. But all over Douglass's work is the struggle to figure out what could this American thing become. Here's what it's promised, and the promise is amazing. Douglass loved the principles of the Declaration of Independence. He loved the Declaration of Independence. He loved the principles, not the practices. I could wander on and on, but back to the Noah quote, just to wrap up. Uh, the setting was, he used it several times, but when Douglas had to give a major speech or had a particularly uh, difficult uh, uh, crossroads moment to explain, go to the Hebrew prophets or even b further back, you go to Genesis or Exodus, the big, the big stories. And you got to remember, this is a world where the big Bible stories were largely common coin. Today, if, well, I just got up and read that quote from Genesis. <laughs> I'm, well, you're also well steeped in the Old Testament. So. But anyway, the setting is this. It's the election year of 1864. From taking uh, Professor Castor's course, you all know that was an amazing election. It's the only time in history a republic tries to hold a 
general election in the midst of an all-out civil war, there'd been a lot of pressure on Lincoln to just call it off, just put it off until somehow when the war is over, we'll have another election. Like, no, 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 no. We're, we're supposed to be fighting this to preserve a republic here, so I think we're going to have to show that we have a republic. Sorry. On the other hand, he thought he was going to lose by August of 64. The war was in a terrible, horrifically bloody stalemate in Virginia, in Georgia, in Mobile Bay, in the Shenandoah Valley. The, the, the North is not yet winning the war. In fact, there's a genuine stalemate out of which the fear was the opposition, which was the Democrats then, running George McClellan for president, uh, the former general whom Lincoln had fired, running McClellan against Lincoln, and the Democrats were running on a platform that was at least, was vague, but it was, what it was clear on is that they were gonna negotiate a peace with the South. Some kind of negotiated end with the Confederacy, which meant that all of this effort now, at least since the Emancipation Proclamation in January 63 to end slavery, bets were off. In August, Lincoln called Douglas to the White House. Douglas had met Lincoln at the White House one year before, but that's because Douglas went to the White House and just got in line and knocked on the door and said, please talk to me. Th that time it was about discriminations against black soldiers. The second time, Lincoln invites Douglas because Lincoln needed him. Lincoln needed the most important black spokesperson of black Americans. At mid-August, 64, Lincoln looks Douglas in the eye and asked him to be the chief agent of organizing a scheme, and he said, the War Department will help you. He was never told how. Organize a scheme to funnel as many slaves out of the Upper South as possible before Election Day in case Lincoln lost the election, such that by the time McClellan wins the presidency and the Democrats take over and they start negotiating with the South, at least whatever, several thousand more slaves will somehow be legally free behind Union lines, setting up God knows what a colossal legal fight that would have started. And Douglas was stunned. Abraham Lincoln is asking him to go be John Brown or something. And Douglas sort of sucked it up and said, okay. He was told the War Department will help you. He went back to Rochester, New York, where he lived. He sent a bunch of telegrams and letters to abolitionists and agents who had been working to recruit black soldiers and so on and so forth. He got a lot of people excited to join this thing that he had no idea how they were supposed to do. And then came the fall of Atlanta to Sherman and the fall of Mobile Bay to Admiral Farragut, which happened actually in the last week of August. And then General Sheridan started moving down the Shenandoah Valley in one success after another, but especially the fall of Atlanta. Changed northern morale within weeks. They didn't have any polling then. We don't have polls on this, but we do have some evidence of change in northern opinion. Until this point, the war weariness in the North was terrible because the casualties, 60,000 Union casualties, dead, wounded, and missing in the summer of 64 alone, just in Virginia. And the Democrats were painting the Republican Party as the party of emancipation. They were doing the same thing our political parties do today, wedge politics. They were called the N-word lovers, and worse. Douglas wanted to go out and campaign for Lincoln now, and they wouldn't let him. Republicans were trying to dance around the emancipation issue now. They don't want to be too, I mean, they are the, the party of emancipation, but you don't have to go out and say it all the time. If you put the Douglas up there on the, on, the, on the stump, that's what you're saying. They wouldn't let him go out and campaign for Lincoln. He found other places to speak, especially to black audiences. But then, on election night in Rochester, and I found this in a newspaper clipping in those scrapbooks at Walter Evans's house. And you know when you're a scholar, you find one source for something? 
you beg you might find a second one so you're not you know out on a limb i never found the second one but i went with this baby <laughs> it's a reminiscence of a guy in rochester 15 years later they did the same thing with douglas they did with lincoln they all wrote their column in some paper the day i did this and that with douglas the day i had lunch with douglas the day i went for a walk with douglas this guy claimed to be the poll worker who put Douglas's ballot in the box that night. Whoopee. But he went on to describe how he lived near Douglas out South Street, and they were walking in late at night to go to the telegraph office to, get to hear the returns of the election. And he says, out of the alley came four drunken white thugs who challenged Douglas to a fight. And our narrative writer says, Douglas put up his fist and said, come on, let's have it. And he claims the four drunken white thugs scurried off into the alley and went away. I don't know if that happened, but I told it anyway. <laughs> now, most importantly, though, and here comes Noah. The following Sunday, after Lincoln is reelected by 55% of the vote and 77% of the soldiers' vote held at the front, Douglas went to Spring Street AME Church in Rochester, black church, where he had spoken countless times before. He could have that pulpit any Sunday afternoon he wanted it to speak about what the election meant. And at Spring Street, the church was mobbed. It couldn't get all the people inside. Douglas went up to the pulpit, and he started the speech with that passage from Genesis. He says, you know the story of Noah and the ark. And suddenly the ark stopped on some kind of land. And Noah wondered. And so Noah sent the dove out. And the dove returned, olive branch in its beak. And Noah wondered again, is it possible? Is it possible? Has the flood come to an end? So he sends the dove out again. And the dove does not return. And so Noah thought, maybe, just maybe. And he took the tarp off the top of the ark, and lo, the world had been renewed. What has Douglas done? The meaning of Lincoln's re-election isn't just about Lincoln. It's now about the real likelihood that this war is going to be prosecuted to the end, with, and the end to Douglas meant the destruction of slavery. He's gone to the oldest rebirth metaphor in Western civilization, Noah's Ark. But he said something else that day. He said, next Sunday, I'm going back to Baltimore. He hadn't been back to Baltimore since he escaped from there in 1838 except he had taken the train through Baltimore but not gotten off twice. He says, I'm going back to Baltimore to celebrate freedom. And the reason was the state of Maryland had just held a referendum on November 1st to vote whether to become a free state. It was a slave state. And the vote was something like 12,820 to 12,510 or something. It was ridiculously close. It, the vote was yes by 300 votes to become a free state. Maryland had been horribly divided during the war. So Douglas says, I'm going home, home, to his native soil of Maryland. Now he calls it his native soil, to the free state of Maryland. So he did, a week later, and he's got paparazzi in tow, which is why we know so much about it. Where does he go? He goes to the Bethel AME Church in Fells Point on Dallas Street, a black church, one of the four churches he had worshipped at when he was a slave teenager in Baltimore. He comes up to the front door, mob, huge crowd is there, they can't all fit inside, and a woman walks up to him and says, hello, Frederick, I'm your sister, Eliza. They hadn't seen each other since 1836. She was his older sister. She'd had eight children. She named one of them Frederick Douglas Mitchell. But they'd never seen each other in all those years. So he took her by the arm, 
They marched up the central aisle of the church. They got up to the altar, we're, we're told, was flanked with American flags. And he begins the same speech with Noah's Ark. Noah sends the dove out. Dove returns, olive branch. Noah sends the dove out again. The dove does not return. Takes the tarp off. Lo, the world is renewed. But then he quoted the rainbow part. He said, we have a rainbow on the sky, as in Genesis. But then he says, but that I am in Baltimore, the former slave state, speaking to you. I am the dove. Now that takes chutzpah. To put yourself into the Noah's Ark story, for God's sake. But I bet you it worked. I am the dove. He was a man of words. And uh, we're yearning for that dove today come back and let us know that somehow the world's renewed, but I, I have no idea when that's going to happen, so thank you. I welcome some comments and questions. Yes, questions, please. Don't be bashful or rude sometimes. We've got some microphones, so just raise your hand if you have questions before we develop the book. Yes? It was my understanding during the Civil War with Lincoln, Douglas was critical of Lincoln at the beginning uh, of the war because he thought Lincoln should free the slaves or advocate for, was Frederick justified in that criticism? <laughs> um, from his perspective, uh, yeah, uh, by and large. Uh, Douglas is in 1861 and, and well into 62, speaking and writing, he had a monthly newspaper. And, and the thing to remember here is Douglas is not the political insider yet. He's very much a political outsider. He's not in any Republican circles yet at all. He doesn't, he doesn't know that preliminary emancipation proclamation is coming until it came. But yeah, from a radical abolitionist point of view, the Lincoln pol or the federal government's policy of returning fugitive slaves to their lawful owners in the South, if that could be done, which was the formal policy of the Union Army and the federal government well into 1862, was a revolting policy. Uh, Douglas went ballistic in August of 62 when Lincoln held a meeting at the White House with four black ministers, hand-picked, no one ever heard of them, from around Washington, D.C., to come to the White House and listen to a formal, frankly, fairly long statement by Lincoln with some press invited in to cover it. This was mid-August of 62. We've had many different interpretations of what Lincoln was up to here, but basically what Lincoln said in this speech is that black and white people really don't have a future together in America. And he invites these four black ministers to help lead the colonization plans and schemes to remove as many black people as possible from the United States and go to Central America and uh, help create the coal industry. Now, some interpreters have said Lincoln was really just conditioning public opinion by doing this. And Lincoln was a clever, clever dude. Let's remember that. But I also think Lincoln didn't know the future. And at that point, did still, by and large, believe in these schemes of colonizing by volunteer efforts, uh, black people out of the United States if they would go. Douglas found that uh, performance uh, beyond disgusting. 
he said, among other things, it was like encountering a horse thief and blaming the horse for the thievery. <laughs> like, you're going to arrest the horse? Um, on the other hand, it's only a month later that Lincoln issues a preliminary proclamation. He already had the preliminary proclamation in a written form in a drawer back at the War Department since July. So, uh, yes, in fact, early or on in the fall of 61, in an editorial attacking this lame brain policy of trying to return fugitive slaves to their legitimate owners, which was an attempt not to offend the border states because Lincoln was so afraid the, bo the four border states that had not seceded from the Union, Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware, Missouri, Lincoln was always so tense about whether those border states would secede. He had good reason for that. But Douglas said that policy makes Abraham Lincoln the most powerful slave catcher in the land. Now, his tune will change markedly after the preliminary proclamation. And in the 100 days betwe between the preliminary and the final Emancipation Proclamation, Douglas was still a little dubious. But before he left Rochester to go to Boston, right after Christmas, for the celebrations they hoped that would take place on January 1st when the final proclamation was to be signed, that's what he said anyway, Douglas crafted an editorial to go into his newspaper in January after the proclamation had been signed and yet it already. And the title was A Day for Poetry and Song. Lincoln hadn't signed it, he wouldn't have published that. <laughs> He'd put that one away. Uh, so it's a very testy relationship between these two, but it grows eventually into what has to be called enormous mutual respect. And these eventual three meetings, I named the two. The third meeting, of course, comes on the day of the second inaugural address. Douglas went to, you probably know this, Douglas went to Washington was standing right down there, if you've seen the famous photographs of Lincoln delivering the second inaugural. Douglas is out right down there about 20 rows out, standing. Douglas just said, I gotta be there. And uh, when he heard the speech, and then frankly when he read it, that was the greatest speech any president ever made because of what it said. It said this war was caused by slavery. This war will destroy slavery. It must, it will. And then after the speech was over, Douglas got in line out on Pennsylvania Avenue and just walked to the White House behind the presidential carriage. He had no invitation to the reception. He just went up and got in line and uh, said, uh, they said, sir, you don't have an invitation. And he said, tell the president Frederick Douglass is here. It took five minutes or so and somebody came back and said, he went in. <laughs> and he did and they met in the East Room, this big reception. We have one eyewitness to this. Douglas tells this story in his third autobiography for all it's worth. He said he could see Lincoln's head up above everybody, blah, blah, blah. And they came together and uh, Lincoln said, Mr. Douglas, what did you think of my speech? Douglas says he demurred. He said, oh, no, no, Mr. President, attend to all of your guests. Doesn't matter what I think. No, Mr. Douglas, there's no one in America whose opinion I value more than yours, blah, blah, blah. So Douglas tells us and there's one eyewitness who heard it said, uh, Mr. President, that was a sacred effort. Uh, by that point in time, this is the way I write about it, Douglas and Lincoln on the emancipation question were speaking from the same script. But they weren't on the same script, <laughs> as you suggest, in the beginning of the war. Other comments, questions? Please, don't be shy. If I see you squirming, I'm going to call on you. Yes, sir, in the orange sweatshirt. Is that orange? Yeah. Okay. Hey, so you use the term wedge politics to <laughs> describe the usage of um, terms like the party of emancipation um, during the abolition era. So can you define the term um, wedge politics for us? 
Sure. And their terms are our terms, because <laughs> it's the same thing. You find out what a party, yeah. if a party has an issue that they've made their own, and you want to make the electorate fear them because of that, then you go for broke. And the Democrats in the 64 election, I always tell my students that the 1864 election was the most racist in American history until the next one. Because 68 was even worse. In the 64 campaign, the Democrats created all kinds of fake news, misinformation, disinformation. They put out these lithographs, these posters called miscegenation balls that showed these pictures of black and white men and women kissing and dancing together and claiming that these balls were being held in major cities all over the North. They called Lincoln Abraham Africanus I, claiming that he was really black. Uh, they used the N-word all the time. And they said, if you vote for Republicans, white men are going to have to marry black women. Black people are going to have all the rights that you have. Your children will go to school with black children. Right then, 1864, fear. Fear is the most motivating thing in politics. You can hate that if you want, but you also, if you're going to go into politics, you better learn how to do it. That's what wedge politics are. Pick your example today. Let's be honest. What were some Republican senators doing in the hearings for Judge Katanji Jackson? What was Ted Cruz doing with this children's book? I'm sorry. One commentator on I don't know what network said that he thought the handling of Judge Jackson by three or four of those senators was a hate crime. That, there was not even wedge issues. They had to invent the issues. Well, sometimes that is what a wedge issue is. Uh, take the issue of uh, CRT. What? The, the non-existent critical race theory not being taught in American schools that is now animating so many local elections in this country and so many school boards is a classic wedge issue. It worked for Yunkin in Virginia and uh, his party now thinks it may work elsewhere, and it might. Now, Democrats have used wedge issues too. They're just not as good at it. Did, is that the way you see a wedge issue? Is that the way you would define a wedge issue? You find a vulnerability about your opponent. Do you remember? You're dumb. No, you're dumb. Of course, you're not old enough. Um, look at the history of gay rights, whether it's marriage equality, LGBT rights, uh, now it's the transgender issue. But if you just look at the history of gay rights and the way it has been used in elections, until it couldn't be used anymore, although, yes, it can, because it's revived again, has always been a classic wedge issue. When Karl Rove was running the Bush campaign, he got gay marriage on the ballot in certain states that might be a little leaning blue, but not quite. Got that on the ballot, and man, they went red. That's finding, now, those people had a perfect right to vote their beliefs. Uh, but anyway, wedge issues have always been around. Uh, I mean, the, the Federalists used it on Jefferson, and the Jeffersonian Republicans used it on the Federalist, uh, the idea of a wedge issue. Uh, it's why conspiracies are, have always been of some kind, have always been part of our politics. You can't wish it away. Oh, God, yeah. Well, well the, yeah, the right in America loves Douglas because he was a Republican. And that's a very different Republican party he belonged to, although it was, it was, he struggled to stay. He remained a loyal Republican the rest of his life, and that was against the wishes of some of the next generation of black leaders. We didn't even get into that. Douglas has all kinds of fights 
very Oedipal stuff going on between the next generation of black leaders and who wanted to knock Douglas off. There's a lot of that nasty stuff in the book, though, if you want to read about it. Let's have one more here. Yes, ma'am, right back there. Yes. Oh, you want the mic, of course. Um, so the Lost Cause narrative is definitely a big topic, kind of, or something that I've looked into a lot. But I was curious, in your opinion, um, how did that kind of affect the teachings and, I mean, current teachings of Frederick Douglass and also just publications of his work? Mm -hmm. Well, the Lost Cause is, of course, the ideology, the narrative, the story that evolved uh, in the wake of the Civil War and particularly by the later 19th century. Uh, where the white South, although they were not alone, one of the great successes of the lost cause story is the way they convinced many Northerners to buy into it. It was the idea that the, that the South had been defeated by uh, a leviathan of industrialization, or as Robert E. Lee called it, superior numbers and resources, that they had never really fought for slavery and had only fought for home and hearth and sovereignty, state sovereignty, states' rights, if you like, um, and that Southern soldiers had fought for their families and their women, and not for slavery, because most of them weren't slaveholders. So the story went. It developed, though, I wrote a, a book <laughs> largely about this called Race and Reunion. It developed into a racial ideology of white supremacy. Uh, by the 1880s, 1890s, a powerful, powerful ideology. And it became eventually not about loss at all, but about victory. Most lost cause speakers, orators, writers, by the 1890s and into the early 20th century, mostly Southern, but not entirely, uh, were no longer arguing about or no longer uh, speaking about what Southern loss meant. It wasn't about defeat anymore, it was about victory, and the victory was over Reconstruction. The 10 to 12 year period after the Civil War, which the South took great pride in defeating, and they did defeat it. This attempt at a biracial democracy in the South, this attempt at uh, the democratization of Southern politics to a degree. Um, so it, it became a victory narrative by 1900, and a victory narrative that the whole nation could own. Um, in an age of uh, a new and virulent kind of white supremacy, best evidenced in the um, widespread practice of lynching, almost all unpunished lynchings. Douglas hated the lost cause, and in that last third of his life, gave endless, in his writings too, he wrote a lot of essays and things like the North American Review and Harper's and other places, um, and then in speech after speech, he attacked the lost cause ideology. He was attacking the lost cause ideology uh, right when Lee died. Lee di Robert E. Lee died in 1870, only five years after the war, and Douglas writes um, a piece in, his, he had a, yet another newspaper he founded called The New National Era, only lasted for three years. But Douglas writes a piece in that uh, paper, and then he used the same phrasing out on the circuit as an orator. He said he was sick and tired of the nauseating flatteries of Robert E. Lee. How is it that the man who leads the crusade to destroy the United States government is now honored in death? Douglas wanted nothing to do with honoring Robert E. Lee. And I've been asked this uh, 60 times, so why not? Had, was Douglas, if Douglas had been around, which of course he's not, um, except in Trump's mind, he might be. Um, if Douglas had been around to see uh, these Lee monuments come down in the last year, he'd have been astonished like the rest of us, but I think he would have cheered. Douglas was fond of using a phrase in his Memorial Day speeches, of which he gave dozens. He would say, please, let's remember there was a right side and a wrong side in the late war. 
Douglas wanted nothing to do with both siderism uh, about the Civil War. He wanted it understood as a struggle caused by slavery, a struggle ended by destroying slavery, and the reinvention of the United States through the three great constitutional amendments as also a result of the destruction of slavery. That we still are debating the merits of, the power of, the influence of this lost cause ideology <sighs> is amazing in one way and to me not amazing in other ways. It simply continues to show us how important those events in the 19th century were. In some ways, the Civil War is never quite over in this country. And Reconstruction is surely never over. As long as we debate federalism, the relationship with the states of the federal government, and as long as we are debating what race means in this country and where it belongs in law or doesn't belong in law and why racism continues to revive no matter what, the Civil War is not quite over. Should be. And that thing called the Confederacy, why doesn't it just go away? It's, it's had a bad run the last four or five years with monuments coming down and flags being taken down. But what did it take to get the flag down in South Carolina? The mass murder in a black church. Um, why doesn't the Confederacy just go? It only lasted four years, for God's sake. Why doesn't it just go away? Because it's still useful. We'll end on that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bad ending.